Three questions. Would you electrocute a total stranger? Look, he's not around anymore, all right, so I'm just going to make him move, all right? No, no, no. Look, honestly. Ah! Would you watch someone steal and do nothing? Would you stay in a building that appears to be on fire just because everyone else does? If your answers were no, think again. What people say they would do is often a far cry from what they actually do when put in the crucible of human behavior. The Human Zoo. Find out what you're capable of. In a lifetime, we encounter millions of people and judge them instantly. Every waking minute, we're interpreting the detail of human behavior. A glance, a gesture, a smile. We're all psychologists. We have to be. So you may not be surprised that no one helps this woman. But do you know why they don't? It may not surprise you that children are disobedient. Could I just ask you to go the other side? Thanks. That's great. Oh, and just be on the apple, it'd be great. Oh, oh. But do you realize how obedient you've become as an adult? That's great. Thanks. You're here to witness the joining in matrimony of this man. It may not surprise you that we get flustered. May not be joined. But this woman, a witness at a wedding, is in bamboozled matrimony. into marrying the groom. I now pronounce you man and wife. And they kiss the bride. I thought something was wrong when I was actually asked to place the ring on his finger. For this program, we've secretly filmed hundreds of people to understand how they behave. Twelve of them agreed to take part in our most ambitious experiment, but they didn't know the whole story. The house they were living in was bristling with hidden cameras. They started off as one big happy family. I don't think we've been treated well. So why did they turn against each other? What drove this woman to tears? Why did simmering tension boil over into aggression? How did the meekest woman in the group become the most domineering? We were all at the end, and now they've got to have a forfeit. Great. Yes! Yes, yes, yes! How many people want beers? And what was this man trying to prove? He's, he's closing it up so we don't know that he's just uh, stolen. About ten cans. I don't know who stole that beer, to be honest with you. I just don't know how that got there. Tonight's programme is about how we try to influence what other people think of us. The importance of first impressions. I've dunked it now, someone might as well have it. Here you have it. I've... And what happens when we get it wrong? How the slightest thing can trip us up. And there were these black hairs curling out of her tights. I couldn't employ her. And how closely we watch each other. Are you lying to me right now? No. at all. In our everyday lives, it all happens in the blink of an eye. We hardly notice it. To see it in detail requires laboratory conditions. So we had to build a human zoo. We chose one of the most isolated spots in Britain, Wastwater in Cumbria. 12 complete strangers, carefully selected from around the country, would live together in this hostel. They'd be invited to take part in a program about human behavior, and they'd be completely cut off so we could control their world. To observe them behaving naturally, we were going to have to film them secretly and get their permission to use the footage once we came clean. We want to watch them meet for the first time, for example, to find out more about first impressions. So although we'll be putting them in the hands of these instructors while they go off doing outdoor activities, 
we are just as interested in what they say and do back at the house. We needed to see everyone, everywhere, all the time. So we started rigging. Hundreds of people apply to be participants in our human zoo, a cross-section of different walks of life and different personality types. We whittled them down to 12. And before they met, we showed them photographs of each other and asked them to make judgments based solely on physical appearance. He looks a bit like a pit bull terrier. He looks a hard, hard bloke, not the sort of bloke you want to mess about with. Quite a funny person. Really, he looks a bit like a mummy's boy, to be honest with you. Possibly a bit stuck up, maybe. He looks like a chef, I don't know why. I can imagine she's quite intelligent. He just looks too snooty for me. Looks a bit of a snob. Athletic, quite intelligent, um, reasonably healthy. I think he could be quite a big challenge, actually. Divorcee, couple of kids. She looks a bit like a lesbian. Construction of our human zoo is almost complete. Two miles of cable will be carrying pictures and sound from 15 hidden cameras and 15 concealed microphones into a secret control room. There, two eminent psychologists will be able to scrutinize anything that moves on banks of monitors. Professor Phil Zimbardo is the world's leading expert in groundbreaking psychology experiments, and his colleague, Dr. Mark McDermott, is one of Britain's top social psychologists. We are about to see a practical experiment unfold. We're going to observe what happens when we put real people in a field experiment. We're interested in things like cooperation and competition. We're interested in group dynamics, how leaders emerge, how rules can come to control people. Uh, we're interested as much in uh, the phenomena of dictatorships uh, as we are in democracy. But really what we learn from this is what people say they would do is often a far cry from what they actually do when put in the crucible of human behavior. And that's really what counts, is understanding what people actually do, not what they imagine they would do. After six months of planning, it's now a few minutes to 12 on Friday the 19th of November, and we're ready for our first participant to walk down this path. But before we watch 12 strangers meet and size each other up, we want to learn more about first impressions. How are they formed and how long does it take? It's a big day for these three women. They're competing for a secretarial job starting Monday morning, and we've been allowed in to film their interviews. They've got 15 minutes each to prove their worth. Or have they? We're about to find out how long it really takes to make a lasting impression. The candidates will be facing Judy Fisher, a recruitment consultant with 30 years' experience. We've given her this dial, which is connected to our control room hidden away in an adjoining office. There, we're effectively going to read Judy's mind. This machine will make a trace of her thought processes. If Judy's impressed, she'll turn her dial up. That will produce a trace high on the screen. If she's underwhelmed, She'll turn it down and the trace will sink. Everything will be scrutinised by occupational psychologist Terry Kellard. Bridget. Hi. Hello, I'm Judy Fisher. Thanks for coming along and being prepared to do this. We're going to talk first of all, Bridget, a little bit about what you've done mm -hmm. and about what you're looking for. Then I'm going to tell you a bit more about the job and we can take it from there. Great. OK? Yeah. Bridget's been sitting down for just 12 seconds and said all of five words but her trace has immediately gone up from an average reading of zero to an impressive 56. Let's just start with, I've um, got your CV here. Clearly she's got a positive impression. That's the most important bit of the interview. That would have been based on what she looks like. She looks like a PA. Yeah, I, just, I like that and I'm good at that and I'm mm. efficient and fast and I do mm. as much of making sure everything's in order as possible. The trace remains like high right till the end, finishing at nearly 100. 
Bridget's prospects look good. Well, you seem very focused, I'm sure you will. You've done really well. Thank, Thank you so much. much. That's great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Right. When anybody meets anybody anywhere for the first time, in order to process information, it is absolutely essential uh, to make a judgment about this person. So essentially what people do is make up their mind about a person and what that person's like, generally within the first 15 seconds. Sometimes you could make your mind up so quickly that I just didn't give them the benefit of any further doubt. Well, I have to say that strong aftershave and strong perfume for that matter are one of my bet noirs. I would be very reluctant to employ a man with fair eyelashes. <laughs> I can think of instances where I can't remember anything about what happened or the person. All I can remember is this smell coming towards me and wanting to get away from it badly. And all I could see through the glass table was the fact that she hadn't shaved her legs and there were these black hairs sort of just like sprouting through the tights, and I couldn't get beyond that. Not crazy about Grey's shoes, I'm afraid. I don't quite know why that I, I feel that way. I mean, she couldn't have shaved her legs for weeks. Lucy, hello, hello. I'm Judy Fisher. Thanks so much for coming along to see me. We're going to just talk a little bit about... Lucy looks fine, so her trace starts slightly above average, but only just, and it doesn't last. Uh, it was my favourite subject at school. It was Listen to her voice. It's beginning to lack expression. You were there for a couple She's of years. licking her lips, signs of tension. Long term, something. At best, the trace is mediocre. At worst, it drops. I'm interested in alternative health and nutrition, and uh, one day I'd like to make my career out of that. In what? Doing what? On what side of it? Well, um, possibly working from working from home, and perhaps in a clinic as well as a uh, alternative health therapist and advisor. Lucy's lifestyle ambitions don't impress. Her trace sinks from plus 30 to minus 30 in 20 seconds. But the next candidate's trace will sink like a stone. Now, this should be very interesting. Shopping bags, an obvious mistake. But how quickly and dramatically will they affect her trace? Valeria, hello. I'm Hi. Judy Fisher. Good to meet you. Thanks Hi. for coming in. In three seconds, it's plummeted to a feeble minus 50. Neither Lucy nor Bridget ever sank that low. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what you've done. Mm -hmm. You um, notice that negative first impression. That's based on what she looked like. She's slightly overweight, carrying shopping bags, low levels of eye contact, and nothing positive has happened yet. And on the creative side, you're keen cinema and theatre to go? Mm. Yeah, very to go much, along. very much. What was the last thing you saw in the cinema? Um, I haven't been for ages, actually. What was the last thing I saw? And what um, about your sort I've... of attention to detail? Are you quite thorough? Yeah, yeah. Because you have got three spelling mistakes in your CV. Do I? Yes. If you convey a bad first impression, you have to work very, very, very hard indeed. Um, there was a little bit of research that showed that it takes eight positive pieces of positive information before you can overcome a first uh, bad first impression. My view would be that even that's very, very difficult. Unlike the other two candidates, Valeria was in fact an actress planted by us without Judy's knowledge. I'd actually been told by Terry to um, fidget to um, not look her in the eye, to not smile, mm -hmm. and to um, move around in my chair quite a bit and just be evasive in general. Looking at the three graphs together, Valeria came a miserable third behind Bridget first and Lucy second. But look closely at the first five seconds. The three women have already been ranked in order, and the order never alters. I didn't find it very easy to go back on a on a snap judgment that I had made, and possibly I'd lost some very fine candidates. It sounds very unfair, but the moment somebody walks in the room for an interview, I know or I can guess quite a lot about them just from the way they're dressed. Bridget, hello. Well done. You did really well in your interview. You were absolutely excellent, and we're delighted to offer you the job. So oh, many congratulations. Thanks very much. And the very best of luck. That's great, thank you. Bridget's been in her new job for 10 months now and is doing well. 
I was quite surprised that it um, showed the results so quickly, the first five seconds, though some of them were very obvious. Valeria was within the first five seconds, was going to have to fight very hard to get better. But first impressions are very, very important. At our human zoo, the first participant is arriving. Caroline is 33, runs her own business, and is married with two children. I'd just like to take a seat. Okay. I just thought, oh my God, what have I let myself in for? Because the room was very, very different from the norm, the normal sort of room that you go in. Very different. There are four hidden cameras in the common room, four in the resource room, three in the dining room, and four more in the hall, the kitchen, and the shop. Hidden away in the hostel's annex is the nerve center, our control room, where we'll begin by watching their first meeting, starting with Amanda. Yeah, I'm terrible with first impressions. I always, I try not to, but I sometimes can't help judging people. And, but um, I think I was more nervous about meeting anybody than assessing what I thought they were like to begin with. This is really the first stage of something that's awkward for all of us, meeting a total stranger in a new situation. This is a situation that all of us have been in. The first day on a new job, the first day in summer camp, the first day at college, uh, where it's so important that people like you, and you're never quite sure of the criteria. How are they judging you? Sharon, on the left, couldn't have realized how she was being judged when she arrived, or else she wouldn't have held court for 20 minutes, which didn't go down well. I was quite scared of her at first. She just came out with all this stuff, and I was like, OK. When she first initially walked in, she was my only concern. She was the only person I noticed and thought, my God, I've not met anybody really that much in your face. Um, what did you guys say last night? She was loud, swearing quite a lot and not really a sort of person that I'd like to have an awful lot to do with. George's arrival has the opposite effect. I think with me, it's either you love me or you hate me. There's no like, oh, he's all right, because I'm quite an extreme person. Hi. 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 Who are you? George. You're Sharon. Hi. Tell George about lunch. Okay. Hi. I'm in the middle of nowhere. Hi. 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 He's immediately candid and friendly with these strangers, and they like him instantly. Michael, on the other hand, has problems when he first meets people. The, the first thing they think is I'm a bit rough because I do a bit of security work. Uh, I'm working on the doors. Well, just a big teddy bear. So I'm just a big teddy bear. Without realising, though, he makes it worse for himself. <laughs> So he's, he's not hugely demonstrative, is he, when he first no. comes in? And now he's sitting back and folding his arms. That kind of body language isn't, isn't good for uh, um, getting to know people. It creates a literal physical barrier. A marked contrast to Thomas, who exudes confidence. Women respond to me in a positive manner, I think, because when I do go out, I tend to get along well with girls and if I'm interested in them, in women. Um, it tends to work out quite well. There you are. Do you take a seat? So in comes Thomas, handsome young man. Uh, he picks up the chair, moves it around. So we're ready. That's a very assertive act. And now he continues. He shakes hands with everybody, introduces himself, gets their names. Mm. He has everybody's names. So look at the advantage that he has created for himself. He now knows everybody's name. People see him as assertive. And so immediately, if, if you stopped the group and said, OK, who are we going to reject and who are we going to keep, Michael would be out of there, and Thomas would be, you know, yeah, we want him in our group. But will they want Richard in their group? I like to play to win. Um, you know, if, if I'm going to enter something, or do something, I want to achieve it to its, you know, 100%. So therefore, you know, I, I'm, I'm out to win all the time. Richard's competitiveness and the fact that he's the oldest mean he'll have to work hard to bond with the others. He'll also need to overcome a small obstacle that we've placed in his path. 
The very first day I walked into the room and I looked around at the people and thought, oh my God, there's all these people here and they're all in their early 20s and, you know, I'm 41 years of age. Now look, we've purposely rigged it here so that there isn't a chair for him. Everybody else has one, so what's he going to do? <laughs> and he's standing back, uh, sort of pretending that what's in his pocket is most important to him. He's standing behind the other person's chair so that the physical structure can come to shape the social behavior that because there was no obvious place for him to sit down, he stood up. Uh, and that, that automatically created an awkwardness of everybody else is comfortable and he's not. And so he's still on the periphery. Uh, and so that already sets him up as an outsider in this group, you know, right from the very beginning. So Richard is somebody I want to keep an eye on. Will he now do things to propel himself more into the center of the group, or will he simply be an outsider for the rest of the experiment? Phil Zimbardo's right to watch Richard closely. All we've done is remove his chair. But in part two, he'll take drastic action in an attempt to transform himself from outsider to hero. Perhaps I did have something to prove. They've only been here for six hours. He had something to do, and he did it. What he's doing is challenging this whole institution. On a first impression, I would think that most people would think tits, legs, and hair. I would love to say my looks doesn't make a difference, but it does. If I was tall and slim with blonde hair and blue eyes, probably I would get more jobs and more people's interest. I, I don't judge fat people thinking, oh, you're horrible, ugly, revolting. It's not like that at all. It's just my personal preference. And all the time you're wondering what people are going to be thinking of you. Are they going to like me? I could be really good looking, but I could be a real cow. They just don't know me. And I think it's quite shallow. The impression you create is affected by the way you look. We tend to think beautiful people are more intelligent, popular, confident, and better at everything from their jobs to flying a plane. And if you can create a favorable impression, you can create advantages for yourself. You're more likely to get what you want. It might be a job, it might be popularity, or it might be the control you have over the people around you. Meet Ruth and Rebecca. Rebecca's classically attractive. Ruth's more on the plain side. They're going to demonstrate that how you look affects how you're treated. They're going to struggle up staircases at opposite ends of Liverpool Street Station in London with heavy bags. And we'll be filming in this workman's hut. First up, Ruth. How long before a knight in shining armour rescues this damsel in distress? at last, but by two women, and it took 45 seconds. Now Rebecca's turn. How long before she's rescued? Would you mind? Just shattered. Um, I'm just trying to get to the top of those stairs there. Can you do the other one at the same time? All of eight seconds. <laughs> oh, she's very kind. Ruth is occasionally saved, but it takes longer. On average, 70 seconds. Rebecca's average, 24 seconds. Just start by these phones here would be great. Thanks. You'd be forgiven for thinking that this caveman behaviour is more about sex than chivalry. Yeah, pretty girl, needing bags carrying upstairs. I'm a sucker for that sort of thing. Every time. From my grandfather, I'm told. He was a charmer too. But there's more to it than that. 
we have a tendency to think highly of beautiful people. They are very, very delicate. Sorry. Um, family heirlooms, would you believe? Bringing them back for my mum. And we want to be near them, as if some of their glory will reflect onto us. Um, have you got a few minutes to spare? Because if he doesn't turn up, I'd, I'd need to get them into a taxi up there. I'm going to be really rude now and ask one more um, favour. Could you, could you lend me some money? How much you need? Can you do them all three? The men are mesmerised. They do Sorry. anything Rebecca oh, asks. You're so strong. Thank you so much. Although they clearly go out of their way for a pretty girl. You're a true gentleman. I really appreciate this. They deny that looks you know, have anything to do with it. Day and I'm really thirsty and I wouldn't mind getting a drink and something to eat. Oh, well, that's all I've got on me at the moment. You're more than welcome to it, eh? If somebody needed help, I'd like to think that I would help everybody across the range, regardless if they're good-looking, attractive, smelly, well-presented or whatever. I always hold doors open for ladies, though some of them slap me in my face, because apparently these days we're perfectly capable of doing it ourselves. <laughs> in fact, I hold doors open for everyone. Lady with prams, uh, old lady with shopping trolley, anything like that. Always. Getting my own way because I'm good-looking makes me feel extremely confident, powerful, and I'm very, very sure of myself. Well, I think it's wrong when people do make the judgments because they should look and see what's inside the person and also give people chances to prove what they can do. We decide whether someone's beautiful instantly. You saw it happen ten minutes ago, though it was so fast you may have missed it. As Thomas arrives at our human zoo, watch Catherine's face in slow motion. It remains to be seen whether anything will blossom between these two, but there's no mistaking that look. Watch again when she shakes his hand, slowed down five times. Psychologists estimate it takes 150 milliseconds to decide whether someone's attractive. And we decide whether someone's successful just as quickly. We go on height, and we're right to. An American study found business graduates earn $600 a year more for every extra inch of height. And in US presidential elections, the taller man has won 17 out of 21 times. So, to test whether size really does matter, we took two actors to the streets of New York. Marcus and Melvin are almost identical. Same age, similar looks, just one obvious difference. Marcus is six foot four, and Melvin's five foot two. But who looks more successful at work? First, tall man Marcus. He's a lawyer, doctor, and there, accountant. I would say he's an executive who likes sports. Probably earns about maybe about half a million a year. 54, 58, close to 60 a year, 60,000. I would say maybe 100, 100,000 a year. He looks like a tycoon. Now, short man, Melvin. He's little. <laughs> Maybe a cook. He's like a cook. I think he's a quiet guy, and he's not very happy. I think he's having a difficult situation right now. So he earns about an average income, nothing fancy, but enough to live on, yeah. Minimum wage, I guess, um, 20,000 a year. On average, they credited Melvin with a meager $20,000 income and Marcus with a whopping $220,000. All thanks to a difference of 14 inches. I wish I was his size, to tell you the truth. In our human zoo, we've left Richard isolated, uncomfortable and unable to break into the group. He'd prefer to be top dog. Like Valeria, he couldn't help making a bad first impression. But without Rebecca's obvious advantages, or Marcus's height, how will he get what he wants? Wastwater is a minute's walk from the hostel. It's very cold, very deep, and our 12 participants are about to go in it, head first. <laughs> right, talk it through with you when you get out there. If you're going to learn to canoe, you have to practice capsizing. It's also a chance for us to see what they're made of. Yeah! 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 
I'd rather do the marathon. Yeah? Do, I've done it for the marathon now this year. I'd rather do the marathon than doing that. Could be 26.2 miles, I'll do that. So the marathon was easier than that. Yeah. I thought we were going to do what you think. your breath back and you talk. Not to be there. It was I thought I was going to get stuck in the boat. Our attention's drawn to George. He's becoming something of a favourite. Richard isn't. And George is winding him up. I thought, oh God, I'm never going to get on with this guy. He's going to drive me around the bend about, you know, his bloody makeup and probably going off to the toilet every five minutes as, five minutes as women do. I had absolutely no idea of what Richard thought of me. He's told me since what he thought of me. I wasn't going to let him know that, you know, he was irritating me in the first instance. They return to the hostel the day's filming done and dusted. Or so they think. Inside, our hidden cameras are still rolling, and Richard's attitude to George appears to be hardening. Right. What are we going to do? We're going to film, we're going to film a lot of George, aren't we? Yeah. There's a fucking tarp on it, let's make sure. Yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> Richard appears to have started a whispering campaign against George. Still the outsider, he's now trying to recruit allies. All right. No, tired. Wet hair. George comes in and he could sit anywhere and he sits right next to Richard. So maybe at some level he's, he's pushing the envelope. He's, you know, he's forcing, yeah. you know, Richard to deal with him. Yeah. Did the doctor, when you went for your medical, say, pull your trousers down so, <laughs> so I can check you've got no hernias? Yeah. Yeah. Because he went, oh, you have to pull them down further than that. I went, what? Really? Yeah. No, they asked you. Oh, right, yeah. pull my trousers down from about there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had his hands there and made me cough. Yeah. He did it quickly, though, which was good, but... Well, that's normal for boys, isn't it? Richard's oh, not amused. Interesting body language here, this arm back and uh, a leg still on the table. It's quite a dominant posture. I need to drink. The stage is set. We have Richard, an outsider, competing with George for the lead role. And though we don't know it yet, he's about to try to steal it. After waiting six hours in vain for Richard to make his move, our resident psychologists decide to call it a day. Nearly a moment too soon, Richard is on the prowl. The shop was closed. The shop is closed. It looks like they're breaking into the shop. This is the moment that answers Phil Zimbardo's question earlier. Will he now do things to propel himself more into the center of the group, or will he simply be an outsider for the rest of the experiment? I don't know. Hang on, hang on, hang on. What you? Where? Um, how many people want beers? An older man trying to ingratiate himself with a younger crowd. He's, he's closing up so we don't know that he's just uh, stolen. About 10 cans. I don't know how he thinks those, those are not going to be missed, but he, he's done it. He obviously doesn't think he's being observed. What are you doing? In the kitchen, shopping. No. I want one. He's like he's shopping. Look, he's getting in the kitchen. Richard's come back again. He's not acting on his own. There's a d diffusion of responsibility here, isn't there, by all these people being involved. Right, there's a ball. Where's the red stripe? It's over there. It's over there. Come on, come on. There's a What I've got to do is make sure they get back, if you're not me. Anybody want any coke? Yeah, take some coke. 
Oh, now he's taking order. It's, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you like over there? Uh, uh, rum and coke and some. Uh, sure. Yeah. Pack the crisps. No, I'll leave the coke. The other stuff is too what's in it. Fancy. Oops. End of day one. They've only been here for six hours. Right. What's going to happen? Already we have vandals and thieves and, yeah, yeah. and rogues. Yeah, what will happen tomorrow? Who wants a beer? We're not going to be a beer. You want a beer? We're not going to No, I'm not going to I think what we're seeing is. Uh, Richard now creating a reputation for himself. He's he's the oldest person in the group. He was always worried about would he be accepted by the others. How many beers? Two beers. Because we can't we can't record this stuff because they won't they will notice it, won't they? And I think he's now demonstrating to the others uh, that he is assertive. He is dominant. Uh, he's somebody that you have to take seriously because what he's doing is challenging this whole institution, breaking, you know, really a fundamental rule. I'm going to go in and I'm going to steal from the people who've set this up. So yeah, I'm really eager to see what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, it's a good start. Yeah, uh, we are we are on our way. Richard stole 14 cans of lager and one Red Bull. Petty theft, but it was also an attempt to transform his status. We've caught the thief. But in part three, the question is, how do you catch a liar? Are you ready for the interrogation? I don't know who stole that beer, to be honest with you. I just don't know how that got there. Are you lying to me now? Poof. He gets a surge of anxiety at that moment. Are you sure you don't want to confess? A service station off the M42 in Birmingham. We've come here to find out what happens if you create a bad first impression of yourself. What sort of reactions will it provoke in other people? We've asked our polite, well-dressed, well-spoken actor, Charlie, to show us. Excuse me, excuse me, could I give you um, a pound, please? Could I give you a pound? No. Why do you want to give me a pound? I just want to give you a pound. Can I give you a pound, please? No, no, sorry. Please? No. Two pounds? No. Two, 250, what, 250? No. 265? Sir, can I give you five pounds? Can I give you fiver? I haven't got any money. No, come, can I give you a fiver? No. No, it's just fi fiver? No, it's okay. No, there's no catch, it's just a pound. I just, I'd, I'd really like to, to give it to you. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Is this number three? Yeah. The examination should be carried out in adequate natural or artificial light. I was sat down having my lunch and reading my correspondence course, and this idiot came and sat down and started looking at me. I said, do you have a problem? Do you have a problem just having a quick read? It's boring here. Really, but I can't afford a paper. What are you doing there? Just having a quick read. It looks interesting. I don't know much about lifting machines. I just thought you'd escape from somewhere. Why don't you just clear off? Do you mind if I check number seven, point seven? <laughs> All I want to do is check point seven, then I can, I'll have a total overview of cleaning lifting machines. Please clear off. Suit yourself. Up. Here, look, have a biscuit. It's very unusual behavior. It's not normal behavior. Not without somebody trying to provoke a fight, anyway. There are rules on how to create the right first impression. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, sorry, just having a little, little sip. I had a bit of a dry throat. Sorry. If you break just one of them, you've got problems. Break two, and you're doomed. Oh, would you want to thin out, or do you want me to throw me out? Sorry? You would. Just having a little dunk of a biscuit. Do you mind disappearing? Or do I go and get some of the ingredients? You've obviously got off the wrong side of the bed. No, no, no. Right, it's right. No, whatever this is, take it and disappear. I'll leave you the biscuits. Okay. Take the biscuits. I don't want take that one. No. Look, I've dunked it now. Someone might as well have it. You have it. <laughs> Richard's been doing his best to repair his bad first impression. And when we confronted him later, he tried to create yet another impression, this time the impression of innocence. 
I don't know who stole that beer, to be honest with you. I just don't know how that got there. If we didn't have evidence, could we tell from his face whether he was telling the truth? <laughs> the answer is in our next experiment. A thief is at work. A shadowy figure has entered the post room at Rutgers University in New Jersey, America. The thief steals $50 and leaves. But this theft has been set up as part of an experiment. These three students were all given the same opportunity to steal. Now we're going to find out which of them did. They'll be grilled by interrogator Dr. Jack Grasso. And behind a two-way mirror, psychologist Dr. Mark Frank, an authority on lying, will be looking for the telltale signs of guilt. As they enter the interrogation room, they will all want to control the impression they create so that they're believed. If they're guilty and don't get caught, they can keep the money. If they're innocent but look guilty, they'll be subjected to a long questionnaire. Dr. Frank says he can spot a liar just by looking at their face. Can you? Are you lying to me right now? Not at all. It would be wrong for me to say something that I didn't do. I can't confess to something I didn't do. There's no real easy guide to lying, no easy guide to truth telling. There's no Pinocchio response. There's nothing that simple. There are some, you know, books that list some of these things, you know, like, uh, well, touching the nose is, is one, you know. To touch the nose means you're lying. Well, nobody's ever found any reliable information about that. Dr. Frank thinks he's found a better way. He spent the last 12 years analyzing the faces of a thousand liars and truth tellers. Now he reckons he can tell them apart. He believes that when liars become anxious, they can't stop themselves appearing for a split second to be afraid. It's somebody struggling with uh, and trying to suppress the fear, and yet it is still leaking through in some places. And sometimes in different parts of the face are leakier than others. As Adam takes first place in the hot seat, Dr. Frank's watching for raised eyebrows drawn together in the middle or a grimacing, downturned mouth, both features of fear. Is it your intention to answer every question about the theft of that money truthfully? Yes. Describe exactly what happened, what you saw and did when you were in that room. Um, I basically came to the room. Uh, I looked around and I checked out the envelope. It was empty and I left. Did you take the money out of the envelope? It was an empty envelope. Uh, no, I didn't. Are you lying to me now? No. Why should I believe you? Because I'm not lying to you right now. I'm, I'm telling you the truth here. Is Dr. Frank convinced? There we go. Now there's a critical moment there. He's just, this is the first big lie. He says he went to the envelope and it was empty. And what you see is a really wonderful micro expression of fear. What he's doing is he's not just raising his eyebrows straight up, they're being raised up and pulled together in the middle. The average person cannot do that deliberately. And so what that suggests to us is there's an emotion that's just shot through a system right there. And when he's just said the envelope was empty, he, poof, he gets this surge of anxiety at that moment. And again, that expression was very, very brief. If we take a look at it again in real time. About the envelope, it was empty. Pow, that's and it. And I left. Less than a second. And later, he believes there's another giveaway. This is interesting. This looks like fear coming out of the bottom part of the face. He's having surges of anxiety at critical moments and at different moments in the course of this uh, interview. We would predict that this sort of a person with this sort of behavioral pattern would be lying. Spot on, Adam was lying. But he may not be the only one. To make life harder for Dr. Frank, we've tricked him with two thieves. Is the other one Debbie? Before we begin the interrogation, just let me ask you a few simple questions to get you used to the procedure. Are you ready? Okay. Do you have a favorite time of the year? Summer. Really, why? What, what makes it good for you? Vacation. <laughs> <laughs> 
or is it Georgia? Is it your intention to answer all of the questions regarding the theft of that money truthfully? Yes. Have you ever before been in a situation like you were in today? Yeah, once, but it was only like five dollars. But I did take it, but... It... Why didn't you take that money? No, I did. It was like five bucks, because, I don't know, it was only five dollars. <laughs> Describe exactly what happened, what you saw, what you did when you were in that room today. Well, I was instructed to go into the room um, to look at the envelope and not take any of the money. Did you take the money out of the envelope? No, I just opened it and looked at it. Why didn't you take the money? Because I didn't earn it. Are you lying to me now? Not at all. So what impression did Debbie make on Dr. Frank? This is quite interesting. Now here, it's, she's being asked about her favorite time of the year. And you actually, she's got almost an anxious look on her face. You can see, if you look at her forehead and the tension in her, in her eyebrows, and they haven't even got to the interview, just asking her about favorite time of year. It, she's an interesting case in that she is showing us almost anticipatory anxiety, waiting for the next question. But as she answers it, she is in fact looking, you know, very natural, and the anxiety goes off her face, and she is dealing with it. And I think a lot of people would see that anxiety and say, ah, there's something wrong here. They may not know what it is. I would think she would be a truth teller who would be, some, would be one that would be misjudged. Did you take the money out of the envelope? Yeah. What about Georgia? At first, Dr. Frank can't find anything to suggest she's lying. I think I, think, I, may, I may have to view her all the way through here and then go back. But finally, he thinks he spots something. Well, I was instructed to go into the room. What you see here, as she's talking about what she was supposed to do, you see on the lower part of her face there, that is the risorius muscle. And the risorius muscle is part of the fear expression. And that suggests to me that she's got a blast of anxiety or fear that's just sort of shot through her system at this point, because she's at the critical moment in the story. But this is really subtle. Of all the people we've seen, uh, she, I think, is the most persuasive liar. I bet many people would miss her and they would judge her as telling the truth. Dr. Frank's verdicts are Adam, guilty. Georgia, guilty. Debbie, not guilty. Right every time. Are you lying to me now? No, I'm not. Richard lied about breaking into the shop, but finally he confessed. <laughs> what do you want me to say about the stolen beer? I mean, who to stole be, the beer? Who stole the beer? I stole the beer. Um, and I, I put my hands up at that. I stole a beer. But why? Time to hear it from the horse's mouth. Perhaps I did have something to prove, not only to myself, but, but to the other people. So, yeah, um, subconsciously, I think, there was that element in there, yes, yeah. I also didn't want to come across as being the, uh, the dad figure, really. I wanted to be part of the group. Um, so, as I say, I, was, I had to try harder to be accepted to be part of the group as well. We've already seen how hard it is to change a bad first impression, though. So Richard's theft was never going to be enough. The others weren't impressed. He had something to do and he did it. Um, yeah, I do think it was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. I would have taken the beer and left money for it. Um, maybe not right away, maybe at the end of the trip, you know, give, giving them the money. It's just not cheeky or naughty or anything. It's just a really childish thing to do. I drank the evidence after, but, you know, but that was OK. Who wants a beer? We're not a beer. They may have drunk the evidence, but they soon forgot his heroics. Richard seems to have proved the point that a bad first impression is hard to repair. However, tomorrow, as they say, is another day, especially in a human zoo. What none of them know is that on day two, we'll be turning this whole world on its head. Today we're splitting you into two groups. I hadn't expected that. It's been decided that there'll be a group A and a group B. And suddenly that was like us against them. They sulked about it. I thought there could be even a punch up at one point. They just took it to heart. It's bullying people and it's like unacceptable behaviour. When it started getting a bit competitive and a bit heated, I thought, oh, work. She definitely is going to have to pay a price for that. <laughs> that was really good. And now she's enjoying the power, the real power that being a red has. Yes! Yes, yes, yes!
how the slightest thing can trip us up. And there were these black hairs curling out of her tights. I couldn't employ her. And how closely we watch each other. Are you lying to me right now? No. In our everyday lives, it all happens in the blink of an eye. We hardly notice it. To see it in detail requires laboratory conditions. So we had to build a human zoo. We chose one of the most isolated spots in Britain, Wastwater in Cumbria. Twelve complete strangers, carefully selected from around the country, would live together in this hostel. They'd be invited to take part in a programme about human behaviour, and they'd be completely cut off so we could control their world. To observe them behaving naturally, we were going to have to film them secretly and get their permission to use the footage once we came clean. We want to watch them meet. Three questions. Would you electrocute a total stranger? Look, he's not around anymore, all right, so I'm just going to make him move, all right? No, no, no. Look, honestly. Ah! Would you watch someone steal and do nothing? Would you stay in a building that appears to be on fire just because everyone else does? If your answers were no, think again. What people say they would do is often a far cry from what they actually do when put in the crucible of human behavior. The Human Zoo. Find out what you're capable of. In a lifetime, we encounter millions of people and judge them for the first time, for example, to find out more about first impressions. So although we'll be putting them in the hands of these instructors while they go off doing outdoor activities, we're just as interested in what they say and do back at the house. We needed to see everyone, everywhere, all the time. So we started rigging. Hundreds of people apply to be participants in our human zoo, a cross-section of different walks of life and different personality types. We whittled them down to 12. And before they met, we showed them photographs of each other and asked them to make judgments based solely on physical appearance. He looks a bit like a pit bull terrier. He looks a hard, hard bloke. What they were living in was bristling with hidden cameras. They started off as one big happy family. I don't think we've been treated well. So why did they turn against each other? What drove this woman to tears? Why did simmering tension boil over into aggression? How did the meekest woman in the group become the most domineering? We were all at the end, and now they've got to have a fall pit. Great. Yes! Yes, yes, yes! How many people want beers? And what was this man trying to prove? He's, he's closing up so we don't know that he's just uh, stolen. About ten cans. I don't know who stole that beer, to be honest with you. I just don't know how that got there. Tonight's programme is about how we try to influence what other people think of us. The importance of first impressions. I've dunked it now, someone might as well have it. Here you have it. I've... And what happens when we get it wrong, instantly. Every waking minute, we're interpreting the detail of human behaviour. A glance, a gesture, a smile. We're all psychologists. 
we have to be. So you may not be surprised that no one helps this woman. But do you know why they don't? It may not surprise you that children are disobedient. Could I just ask you to go the other side? Thanks. That's great. Oh, and just be on the apple, it would be great. Oh, oh. But do you realise how obedient you've become as an adult? That's great. Thanks. You're here to witness the joining in matrimony of this man. It may not surprise you that we get flustered, but this woman, a witness at a wedding, is in bamboozled matrimony. into marrying the groom. I now pronounce you man and wife. And they kiss the bride. I thought something was wrong when I was actually asked to place the ring on his finger. For this programme, we've secretly filmed hundreds of people to understand how they behave. Twelve of them agreed to take part in our most ambitious experiment, but they didn't know the whole story. The house.